Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, joining us in this uh, first uh, talk in our um, second webinar series, or second edition of our webinar series, I guess, um, the, the 2022 uh, winter webinar. Um, so we have two more coming up uh, in uh, February and March, on the 4th of February and the 4th of March. So quite easy to remember, same time. Uh, you will get, uh, we will be sending out the, uh, the poster and the details and all of that. Uh, but the information is also there on our website, which is www.thanaticethics.com. Um, and we are also in the, in the process of putting together our first uh, conference, uh, which is going to take place in Oxford um, from the 28th, 28th to the 30th of April um, of this year. Um, it is going to happen in in face to face mode, um, so um, you can look that up if you're interested. Um, I guess I guess that's it from me. So uh, Judith, did you want to say anything? Am I missing anything? No, not not particularly. So <laughs> okay, I'm fine. Happy happy well, to be here. No. All right. <laughs> um, so I'll pass it on to um, to Thomas to introduce our speaker today. Thank you. Thank you, Bidisha. So yes, my name is Thomas Lacroix, and I'm very glad to, to introduce uh, Alessandro Corso, who is uh, uh, an anthropologist. He's based at the uh, Oxford uh, um, uh, Dev International Development Department at uh, uh, Oxford. And uh, uh, so Alessandro, he's uh, finished his PhD in 2018. He works on the states of presence and absence and life at the borderlands and ordinary ethics. You more specifically worked on the island of Lampedusa and on the sea crossing of refugees from North Africa to Europe. Uh, your doctoral PhD uh, is titled Lives at the Borders, Abandonment and Survival at the Frontier of Lampedusa. And uh, you are currently in the process of publishing this, um, this, uh, this work at the uh, uh, University of Pennsylvania Press. And uh, beyond your academic uh, commitments, you also are an artist and you also use uh, um, uh, artistic expression and graphic expression to, to address, to face um, your, the, your object of research which is extremely engaging, of course, and, and uh, of course, um, it, it, it's a, an emotional engagement. And you are going to talk about that and how you face your, your, this object of research and how you try to, to combine your uh, academic and artistic uh, engagement to, to address uh, this issue today. So, um, Alessandro, the floor is yours, and uh, the, uh, after your, your talk, we will have a, a, um, a Q&A. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for this invitation. It is a pleasure to be here, and uh, I hope this will give us an opportunity to engage in further discussion uh, later. Uh, let me just uh, try to share the PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. You confirm it works? Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Right. So since the webinar is, 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 is of course, but this is a project on, on the ethics of, of death. And as, as Thomas was was uh, was uh, saying, well, I was thinking to to consider some of the work I've done on the island of Lampedusa, but developed in particular on a on 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 a, on a, on a paper I, I I've recently worked on, uh, which is which was called "Judgment, Doubts, and Self Doubts: Confessions from an Anthropologist on the Island of Lampedusa." But I've introduced this, this idea of art of confession that I will explain uh, briefly at, at the end of the, of the presentation. Uh, now, what I would like to do is to attempt to address 
a quite difficult question, which is the one of uh, responsibility and how responsibility is linked to the idea and concept of doubt when we face uh, borderland uh, situations. And in this case, borderland situations at the borderland of Lampedusa and the encounter of life and life which somehow embodies forms of death in many and, and different uh, ways. And the core issues I wanted to address in the specific uh, case are uh, the following. So what is the, the, the responsibility of, of being an anthropologist? So what is, what is it to be a witness of forced migration? And what does this entail for, for, for an ethnographer or for an anthropologist? And what does such responsibility somehow, how, how is it linked to the exercise of, of doubting? And when I say doubting, I mean doubting about the world we witness, but also doubting about ourselves. The second point is an attentiveness towards uncertainty as it emerges from contested and ethically dismantling uh, situations. And the third is our acknowledgement of these ethical dilemmas as we encounter them in the field sites and reach our understanding of others' life words, but also an understanding of what is our role and what we are doing in, in the field. In order to begin to, to, to address this conversation, I would like to start from a particular moment, uh, which uh, raises from my field sites. Uh, I've conducted field work in Lampedusa between 2016 and 2017 for about one year. And uh, let me just uh, introduce this moment and then we will hopefully uh, look at it towards the end with, with a different uh, perspective. So it, it was a, a odd night of uh, July on uh, the island of uh, Lampedusa. And I was uh, sleeping at that time, came back from a very uh, hard day, speaking with uh, several migration workers and uh, attending two migrant landings. Um, during the night, I, I received this phone call. And, and, and uh, as soon as, as this happened, I've tried to quickly write down some, some notes about, about it. And I'll just read it to, to, to you. Coming back home, I received a phone call. There will be a new landing tonight, and as usual, it will be at Favarolo Pier, where most migrant landings took place in Lampedusa. They, the migrants, are in 200, all in relatively good conditions, it seems. A strong sense of discomfort takes hold on me. Another, I think, between myself, as I take off my shoes after my day spent with some cultural mediators, talking about the deficient conditions of the CPSA, Centro di Primo Soccorso d'Accoglienza. I am tired, tired and listless. I only feel like being at home, alone, far away from everyone and everything. I don't want to see, I've seen enough already. I've seen those scenes, those persons. I've seen the spectacle, migrant landing far too many times. And as I become addicted to it, I only want peace and solitude. As I see my own reflection into the mirror, estranged by my own reaction, I wonder and I try to understand why. Now, this article, the article from which I've, I've, I've taken, uh, uh, of course, the, this work and, and, and the presentation in general is really a response to, to this moment of the subtle and quite intimate doubt as, as I have expressed it in, in, this, in these field notes, in a form of what I call a confession. So what is that I've tried, that I'm trying to, to confess here? Uh, that, of course, I'm not the anthropologist Hermes. So when I say the anthropologist Hermes, I refer to the work of Vincent Crapanzano, who provocatively uh, tried to make us all think about how the anthropologist has been traditionally kind of charged with this responsibility of being the messenger between two uh, 
different uh, words, uh, but it is a confession of the fact that being a messenger uh, is, is something which has to be uh, acknowledged in, in, in different ways and from different perspectives, starting from confessing and, and putting on the table prejudices, convictions, fallacies, and forms of doubts as they emerge during the encounter with, uh, with the world we are, we are witnessing. Of course, in, in, in the anthropological uh, scenario, we, we have seen uh, many works that have engaged with the importance of revealing these forms of uncertainty, fallacies, human fa fallacies, and, and, and putting doubt in, in, doubt in the center of our analysis from Paul Rabino with his uh, reflections on fieldwork in Morocco, and then going on with the existential anthropology of Michael Jackson, and the approach to ethics through ordinary ethics of, uh, of Vina Das, as well as many other anthropologists who have really uh, kind of warned us on how important it is to put doubt as in the center of the analysis and see it as really endemic to anthropological and knowledge production. Not only in anthropology, but also in a long tradition of philosophy, we do see the importance of uh, recognizing, acknowledging human uh, weaknesses and fragilities. And here I mainly think, and this is the reason of using the term provocatively of confession, the work of St. Augustine and the idea of C. Fowler sum from Latin, which is, if I'm wrong, I am. Uh, the idea of recognizing this wrongness uh, in relation to being. And uh, also on the other end, the work of Socrates, this, this, this attempt towards the other citizens as a philosopher and as a, as a citizen in, himself to say that, he, you know, to, to, to recognize the, 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 the fallacies of, of, of being a philosopher, of being of being uh, human. I know I do not know, but I know I do not know does not mean not to know anything, but it means to recognize one's fragilities and one's limitations in order to get to some deeper level of, of understanding or trying to do that at least. So why is all of this work and way of thinking and approach important when we try to discuss issues which have to do with the borderland of Lampedusa, borderland in general, or borderland situations. So let me just briefly uh, give you a context. The work I've done, as I said before, was on the island of Lampedusa, which itself is in a, of course, a borderland space, is in, in the Mediterranean Sea, uh, south of Sicily, north of Libya, and east of uh, Tunisia, very close to, to Malta. Uh, it is a borderland space, it is a beautiful island, uh, and it is, of course, a frontier, not only for its geographical position, but because of a set of uh, political and historical conditions which have produced and have created uh, the conditions for which Lampedusa became a frontier a frontier and a borderland space uh, in many uh, ways, uh, where we see a, in, in the past 30 years at least, a strong uh, contestation between humanitarian and securitarian policies. We see a constant and ongoing production of legality and illegality in many forms through practices of bordering and securitization, but also through certain narratives that are constantly reiterated and, and produced in, in different forms. It's a place that has been recognized as a land of hospitality, but also of content, constant reminder of how important it is to, to intervene for border protection. But at the end, it's especially an existential borderland. It is a space where life and death are in are constantly challenged. And they are challenged not only at 
in the Mediterranean that has been now in, in recent and less recent works in anthropology and social sciences recognizes uh, recognized as, as a cemetery, uh, a cemetery of, of, of people who are keeping dying as, as we speak. And it was like this in 2016, it is, it is getting even worse at, at uh, the moment, but it is also a space of death on land. We see abandonment and absence uh, taking different forms. This is a picture of a square of, of, of the cemetery of Lampedusa where about uh, 40 people have been buried without uh, clear recognition and uh, a name or an ident identification. And the crosses you see they're scattered, they've been produced by um, the, the, the old cemetery gatekeeper who who tried to do this in, in as a gesture of care towards the towards the dead migrant, see himself retrieved and 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 buried in 1996 and later on in the years, and it is a space of death and abandonment also in in other forms. This is the so-called boat cemetery that is another space of the island, completely abandoned and in theory inaccessible because because it is a militarized area of the air, of the um, air forces um, where a lot of migrant boats that have been used for the um, uh, the journey uh, remained uh, for many years with all the belongings safe jackets uh, milk boxes books and and many other things for for, for years there left abandoned in a kind of open museum of, of, of absence. Lampedusa is also considered as the door of Europe. Uh, this is uh, the work of uh, Mimo Valladino. He's, a, he's an artist of, of, uh, who tried to, 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 to sort of uh, uh, speak about Lampedusa as door of Europe in this gesture of uh, hospitality as a window, as, as an entry point, right? But on the left, uh, on the right side of the screen, you also see a detail of this door in 2016, uh, which uh, demonstrates, shows how the door of Europe, which was uh, kind of uh, full of very nice artistic uh, elements, uh, has been ruined by uh, some locals and other people uh, who showed their frustration towards ongoing situations uh, that are very badly handled by uh, the local uh, administration, uh, the EU, and, uh, and, and the policies which, which govern uh, the so-called emergency or crisis of uh, irregular migration, and they've been governing it in, in the many years. So this is a place of contestation between locals and migrants, uh, but also police agents and locals, and migration workers and migrants. And in this specific case, I would like to focus on the migration workers, because in my work, I've addressed locals, migrants, and migration workers in their daily life in Lampedusa. But I think that having a look, a look at migration workers' perspective may help us to get somewhere in the in the analysis uh, today. So if this is the, the door of Europe, so symbolically the, the southernmost point of entry of uh, irregular migrants to, to, to Europe, the actual arrival doesn't happen through this door, which is of course uh, symbolic, but it happens at the Favaloro Pier. Now the Favaloro Pier is the, the pier, the place where most mi migrant landings take place. Um, in these pictures, you see on the one end uh, the uh, kind of what you see opposite the Favaroa Pier, which is a few tourist boats, in particular one big boat, which is a pirate-looking uh, uh, boat used for um, tourists to to enjoy the, the the beauty of Lampedusa, because Lampedusa is still it has been a, and it's even more now a touristic island. And as uh, tourism developed in the, in, the, in the summer season, in the tourist season, in front of you, uh, you, you, can, you can actually 
uh, see uh, migrant landings uh, going uh, going on. Uh, of course, the distance that uh, you have from 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 the scene, uh, because migrant landings, of course, are not. Uh, no one is authorized to, to, to be there, uh, but uh, the picture you are seeing kind of shows you the closest point from which you can see a migrant landing. Doesn't quite allow to see much about what's going on at the pier. You only see a kind of group of, of colorful dots, people in uniform, um, and uh, a lot of other people who have been disembarked from the either Coast Guard or the finance in this case, or that, or other uh, police uh, boats that are in charge of of, uh, of these disembarkment uh, operations. But if this is what you see from a distance, what you instead can witness as as someone who is there at the pier is slightly different. And I will try to read some notes from from my from my uh, work. It is nighttime in Lampedusa when the Coast Guard boat approaches land and the dazed faces of the migrants appear more distinctly from the darkness. As the boat moves closer to the pier, the beams from the spotlights on land illuminate them. They have been at sea for two days, the Coast Guard captain tells me. The first migrants to touch land almost fall to the ground. They are weak after so many hours at sea. Nicole and Roberto, two of the operatori workers from the Misericordia di Caporizzudo, Lampedusa, take them to the CPSA bus. As they land, the migrants, mostly male, are pushed quite roughly towards the medical checkup area. Their feet are mostly swollen. Some are wearing t-shirts, while others are naked from the waist up. As they walk through the narrow corridor left for them on the pier, past the ambulance and towards the CPSA bus, the migrants display bold bodies. Some are statuesque, other very thin. Most of them have worked in conditions of exploitation in, in Libya for weeks, months, or years, as they will tell me in the following days. This description of one of the migrant landings, which again is quite different from what you could see from the first picture, can be further um, kind of developed in this second description on a different landing. The first patrol boat arrives and everyone gathers around the pier. They are coming, they are, they are here, come on, come on. It's incredible to think of the dynamics I'm both witnessing and also taking part in. We, some cultural mediators and I, wait at the pier. We wait for what purpose? often with impatience, sometimes with annoyance, other times with worry, but we wait for them to arrive. We wait to take pictures, to see, to know, to welcome, to get rid of those knacks which are already open and nobody knows who to give to anymore, to make sure that everyone is healthy, to check that everything is going ahead as planned. While we wait, we make jokes, we laugh, we talk about football, we think about what to do later that day. We live our normal life, which will soon come face to face, albeit only for a short amount of time, with the lives of those we have been anxiously and nervously waiting for. Now, of course, the description which uh, the two descriptions I've just, I've just read come from a certain experience of the migrant landing, uh, which uh, speaks a lot and, and somehow is, is very much related to a lot of work that has been done at the borders of, of Europe and, and speaks about borders as spaces of spectacularization, as, as theatralized space. So the spectacle of the migrant landing or the theater, theater of the migrant landing is something very tangible once you once you are there and you and you witness these events repeating and repeating time by time because at the migrant landing what you can see is a sort of a setup uh, situation that keeps repeating every time with 
people who know precisely what they have to do. There are cultural mediators, there are Frontex agents, doctors, rescue agents from the Coast Guard, police agents, there are volunteers giving snacks and, and giving hot uh, drinks when it's needed or in summer cold drinks, journalists, researchers interested in understanding what's going on as well as journalists. But again, everything seems to be so well planned and, and it repeats in quite similar manners every time one goes at a landing. So one starts to, to ask what is the effectiveness of such uh, measures? What is the point? Because everyone is present. There is the state, there is the, the, the representatives of the EU, there is the humanitarian agents and the volunteers. All are there, all, 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 all are, are present, but things don't seem to change, they repeat. Uh, people keep uh, dying, there, the, the, there are shipwrecks, ongoingly, there are people who arrive suffering, and the system just keeps going as, as usual. So one starts to wonder what's, what's going on. And not only that, you also start to wonder how is it possible that, that, that people can, can kind of deal with this sort of quite mad situations in ways that from the perspective of, a, of an observer at first, seem quite normalized. There is, of course, here an ethical picture that is produced, an ethical picture that we may want or try to escape by looking at ethics as something which is transformative, ongoing, and uh, fragmented, and, and, and understanding it as such. But the reality of it is that you do produce some sort of ethical picture, and you do produce some sort of judgment. You ask, how, how is this possible? How can migration workers are like that? How can they think about football as people are arriving in such conditions? How can they uh, go drinking 10 minutes after a migrant landing? How can they come from a karaoke night to, to then go and witness uh, certain, uh, certain situations of, of suffering or, 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 or pain? So judgment here is very important, but again, we, we go back to that picture of the anthropologist, which somehow acts as if he or she was able to be a, an objective observer, a messenger who was able to report what's going on and was able to really uh, uh, make sense of, 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 of reality despite of, of what is going on in, in uh, in its, in, in its complexity, right? So this, this judgmental attitude is, is of course problematic, but it's part of, of the experience of, of being there. Of course, with time and, and with uh, the possibility of living on a place like Lampedusa for months, uh, I've been there for a year and then returned uh, every year, one also begins to, to see things in a slightly different way. Ordinary life, uh, of course, um, becomes something which, which, which is not just, uh, with, with does, which doesn't just belong to others, but uh, you start to live there as well. You start to, to, to realize and to, to, become, to become embedded into, into the field site. To, to realize how important it is to actually find some space for yourself. Uh, Lampedusa is a, is a place where, as I said before, is a touristic space, but it's also a place where people uh, enjoy the beauty of the island, there are nights out, there is uh, chilling at the pub, there is, there is uh, going at the beach, and all of this stuff happens with tourists who come visit the island, but also with the workers who are there and, and, and work for months or for years. And you also realize that, uh, interestingly enough, uh, you, you don't do field work, but yeah, field work does you in a way that uh, you, you start to, to, to normalize the very, uh, sort of uh, experiences and, and situations that you were first judging 
from a from a distant point, right? And you get closer and closer with those kind of of uh, of situation. So the assumptions you had about the roles and rules of migration workers, the positionality, right? So uh, what, what is the role of a doctor? What is the role of a migration worker, of a police agent, of a researcher? Uh, begin to, to sort of crumble. The, the idea of ethics, that picture of ethics begins to, 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 to crumble. Um, and you begin to feel quite a powerless witness of this kind of set of contradictions to which you don't quite know how to respond to. Now, one way of responding to this is, is writing and writing in the form of trembling, in the form of, of doubt, in the form of uh, which reveal the uncertainty that one feels and experiences in this kind of conditions. Let me, let me read what I mean by that. And this is another piece of excerpt from uh, Migrant Landing. Women walk, uh, men follow. And this landing, what is it? What am I observing exactly? Is it the policeman in high uniform walking about uh, and, waving, and waving to his colleagues? The bossy attitude of Vito, the cultural mediators laughs while they sit in waiting. The pointless worries of activists getting ready to give snacks, water, or whatever is they carried for the coming migrants. What is the focus? The exact number of disembarked migrants, how they stay put, the way they sit, as drowsy, drained, and exhausted people waiting to finally touch land after being rescued at sea, sitting in rows with absent and tired cases, as opposed to the few men from the Coast Guard in white hazard suits and face masks, all masked up as if they have just returned from the moon. Of course, this kind of, uh, of, of uncertain, uh, quite uh, doubtful writing is to some extent, or can be read to some extent as a form of redemption, uh, redemption an attempt to, to, to declare uh, one's uh, powerlessness one's doubts, uh, the inability to really be able to effectively respond to a situation which keeps happening despite what one has to do or to say. But this has a lot to do also with the acceptance of uh, one's limitation. And of course, with an attempt to some extent to write on behalf of others, to, 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 to speak for others, but also to begin to, to initiate a conversation with, with oneself through the means of doubt. And here we go back to the first uh, excerpt I was uh, reading, uh, which is the one about me coming back and receiving a phone call and facing uh, the, 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 the mirror of fieldwork to some extent, recognizing that I was myself tired and listless and I just wanted to to go on. So from this first attempt of writing as a redemption, then you move on to another condition of, of really realizing the, the, the split between some kind of or a part of yourself who wants to be there, wants to be present, wants to be a witness, a messenger, a, a, a powerful actor in, in the spectacle, which is a spectacle of life, a very real one. But at the same time, also this kind of uh, visceral need to be away, to take time, to get out, to stop thinking about it, to, to be somewhere else. Now, although these reactions may seem quite, uh, I don't know, obvious or banal or, or, or uh, simply understandable, I think that the, the fact, the very fact of revealing them, of putting them on the table, of using them as the core subject of our analysis is fundamental if we want to really address questions which have to do with responsibility and also linking them with the idea of uh, judgment. And Anna Arendt here is uh, very, very telling and important in uh, collected essays on responsibility and judgment in the idea of, of understanding and conceptualizing intellectual engagement and thought thinking as a self-dialogical act, 
as, as a conversation with the self. But conversation with the self does not only mean to reveal certain kind of fallacies and human fragilities, but it also means to be able to acknowledge what it entails for, a, for an ethical journey, for an ethical uh, writing from an understanding of ethics to face the mirror of fieldwork. And the mirror of fieldwork is not only made of this kind of reflection of yourself into the mirror, but the reflection is mirroring as well what is going on in the field. And the questions that, um, that does come uh, from this are, is this chaos, this confusion, this sense of doubting just mine, or is it something that is shared among the others? Are uh, migration workers, doctors, cultural mediators uh, kind of experiencing something similar to what I'm experiencing? How do they respond to, 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 to the responsibility of being witnesses of borderland situations? So this kind of opening, these this abilities, at this, at this, this, this attempt to converse with myself and to take seriously these notes, these moments of doubt and fallacies, helped a lot to begin to have a deeper conversation with the migration workers themselves and to try and really understand what their, their life was beyond the roles, rules, and uniforms we were first describing from a certain distance looked like looked like from the inside from from their perspective this is a line from a, a policeman in charge of frontex operation a commandant who once told me that after all from a human point of view everything is tough here he then added that seeing a woman with her baby as she gets rescued at sea gives you goosebumps my children are lucky, they have everything. This is not right, it's not acceptable. When we intervene, I feel like a microbe. I am a microbe, he says, with a sad tone of acceptance. He also added that a microbe he felt to be was nevertheless a positive one. If I can give positivity, why not? If you can, you give. Perhaps nothing will change, you can't change much, but at least you do your best. You don't want to clean cautions, but at least I do my part. So here we start to see this kind of contradictory um, uh, moments in, in which someone like a police agent recognizes both the powerlessness of being in his role, but also the power he has to do something about it. Similarly, migration workers like Said say that and recognize that the system that manages the regular migration is a system of human flesh, that no one really wanted to create the conditions for people to stop dying and suffering as they were. And also that not many people are like you and me, he said, most people do not care. Here again, we, we see these this contradictions of a, of, a, of, a, of a man in his late 30s who has been an irregular migrant, and after about 10 years, he became a cultural mediator for EASO. And he was in the position to both recognize the, uh, recognizing the madness of the system, but also to somehow consider himself as being able to be there and to show some care toward those people. At the same time, doctors like the infectious disease uh, specialist uh, Fiona uh, went through some moments in which they really couldn't manage to, 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 to deal with certain ethical struggles they were, they were going through. She once said, as we were at the beach enjoying the beautiful uh, summer uh, time in there, that uh, I can't take it anymore, I need to leave. I found whipping marks all over his body, she said touching her shoulders, going down to her hips, then the stomach and the back. He was full of lashes, I tell you, like a Jesus Christ, unbelievable. Fiona said that the migrant man's sister had been publicly tortured in Libya and was still there. 
It's absurd that all of this happens at the Fiona, lowering her gaze. Now, these absurd situations, these absurd uh, conditions find different forms in different subjectivities and individuals who have different roles. And it is, of course, very hard to be able to transcribe and translate them into a form of structured and argumentative analysis because their very nature is, is, is one of uncertainty and profound doubt. So it is not only important to uh, be able, as I said before, to introduce this element of self-dialogue and, and conversation with the self in order to be able to be open to these kind of situations and and, and, and begin to see them not as totally separate, but as something that you yourself experience as a researcher and uh, as a witness of certain situations. But it is also interesting to see how an artistic approach could help, uh, could help to, to uh, uh, sort of uh, um, work uh, with, with, with these with this, uh, difficulties. And uh, yes, as an artist, I've, I've tried to do so. I've tried not only to write in, in kind of more open, creative or artistic forms, but also try to use art in order to express what was going on, not only in, 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 in my own experience, but in this kind of messy experiences we were all sharing together. The stories is of, of violence, of rape, killing, suffering, hope, but also strength and belief. I was keeping hearing from the migrants and from the migration workers uh, as well, were transcribed and translated into this painting, which is the one of a young migrant of 19 year old called Mohammed from the Gambia, uh, whom I met. And retrospectively, as I look at this painting, I think that there is some attempt to put in the canvas with these uh, strong and fast uh, toothbrushes, the fragility of, of, of the encounter with, with people who were alive in that moment, but in their life, they were also bringing some elements and forms of death and also of the madness of the system we were all being uh, witnesses to. Uh, it's also something which reveals the shared moments of discomfort that uh, took place, not only at the migrant landing, but also at the CPSA inside the detention center that, 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 that I could not witness and see. So a space of invisibility, which was made visible, however, by speaking to migrants who could uh, come out from the CPSA at times, uh, although they were not technically allowed to do that, and with migration workers. It also speaks about the rules that one must follow, but also one tries to overcome. There were some migration workers who gave secretly their phone to migrants to allow them to, to do international calls because their credit was, was over, although this was not technically possible. Some of bought shampoos and, 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 and food, although this was not allowed. And many others who, who took guitars and started playing music and singing to cheer them up, creating this kind of um, incredible spaces of mutuality and reciprocity and, and encounter. These encounters are also encounters, yes, between border agents and migrants, cultural mediators who have been migrants and now are meeting their fellow migrants and doctors and subjected people as the case of Fiona that we saw before but mainly it is an encounter between life and, and death. And again, this other painting, which retrospectively I read as some sort of attempt to depict through these two flowers, the, the, the lightness of life, which somehow keeps uh, flourishing despite everything, despite the heaviness of the rock, which sinks in the bottom of the sea could be the Mediterranean Sea or any other space, is, is another form of trying to, to produce uh, testimonies, something that is tangible and it's uh, present, it's there about the difficulty of, of, of being at the border 
and of trying to understand what addicts may may be uh, what, more, what 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 ordinary addicts may look like in uh, in similar in similar contexts so just to conclude uh, how to deal with these contradictions uh, i don't have an answer but probably an important uh, route an important way would be to begin to 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 to, to acknowledge doubt to let doubt emerge to engage in self dialogue and to recognize borderlands as phases of ethical uh, struggle uh, in order to be able to acknowledge not only the fragilities of all actors we are uh, working with from migrants to migration workers and actually also the local community but the fragilities of the researchers themselves and through the recognition and the confession provocatively speaking of these fragilities being able to produce a space of encounter and conversation with ourselves and with the ethical fragmented and difficult realities that others are experiencing in the field site. Um, I just uh, wanted to conclude by uh, reading just a little piece of the of the of the ending of of the paper, just to give you a last study of what I've tried to say in in the written form. Um, in order to transcend an ideal of a supreme act of responsibility, I've tried to begin from ethnographic based reflection on responsibility, which led to an understanding of ethics as a manifestation of human limitations fallacies and doubts. As I have learned through my fieldwork in Lampedusa, the reality of lived experience at the frontier is much more fragmented than the mediated reality broadcasted to the local and international audience. And life at the borderlands ultimately emerges as a mosaic of ordinarily extraordinary emotions, frustration, agitation, the sense of absurd and discomfort. In order to address such a complex picture, one needs to reveal something important to the reader. Beyond the curtains of a broadcast and media constructed theater, life goes on and it takes ugly forms at times. These can be uncanny, destabilizing and discomforting. We are not always ready and never we will be for some experiences in life. And once we meet them, we usually tremble, shake, run away, and seek consolation in certainty. But the experience of trembling, as Derrida explains, is a meaningful one. It is when the body signals something important to us, something we may not be able, ready, or careful enough to detect. If we, however, take the time to feel the trembling and try to reveal, what the sensation is signaling us, we may be able to find other terrains of knowledge, exploration, and the language which allows us to speak without secret, without fear, and without limits other than our own. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's been a... Uh, uh, it's been a very powerful presentation. It's uh, really extremely grappling. And thank you very much. It's been, uh, uh, I think you, you've touched upon something which is, um, which is part of our daily work. I mean, the, this, uh, this sense of powerlessness and of doubt is of course, as you mentioned at the beginning, it's, it's part of our, our daily work. But of course, when you, when you face such the, the spectacle of the absurdity of death uh, as you have done, uh, this doubt uh, has, is absolutely, it's completely exacerbated. So thank you very much to have put words and thoughts on the, on the on this uh, on this uh, confrontation to this uh, um, to this to this issue. Um, I've got a full page of questions, <laughs> but uh, I, I would well, I'm sure that the others have also a lot of uh, questions. So yeah, uh, is does anyone? want to say something, want to, to ask a question. Um, so I think you can raise your hands. 
or in the meantime, just to let the people to put together um, their well, yeah, yeah, maybe yeah, maybe just just to give you know people time to uh, to recover in a way yeah. from, from <laughs> it was an extremely you know powerful uh, mm. talk. So thank you so much, mm. uh, Alessandro, and uh, you know when I mean about this project, the Thanatic Ethics project. I mean, a lot of people have been wondering about, you know, this transdisciplinarity and why we're not focusing on, you know, mm -hmm. one field rather than another one. We're going to send those people to you. So, <laughs> <laughs> because in fact, uh, you give, you know, you give all the reasons why it has to be, uh, it has to cross, you know, all the, the disciplines and what you have said, about the um, uh, you know the power of doubt and the power of the narrative uh, as well, and using that notion of writing as trembling, which is uh, so so powerful in itself, is extremely enlightening and and it's susceptible to uh, you know change somebody's perspective actually. So thank you you know so very much. I would have just a couple of uh, very quick uh, you know questions. Um, one is about what you said about time, you know, the dimension of time that in fact it changes. I mean, the fact of spending time uh, there, going back, um, leaving, returning, etc. I mean, it does change your perspective as well. I, I wonder whether you could develop this just, you know, a little bit more because it seems crucial to me. Um, and also another question, I mean, the words you've been using, some of the words you've been using um, have a religious connotation. Confession and redemption. Is it because there are no other words possible? Is it a deliberate choice? Is it, I mean, also, you know, I would be interested in, uh, in your thoughts and insights about this. Yeah. Th thanks a lot, Judith. I, I'm I'm happy to to hear all of these words, and also the questions are super relevant and important. Uh, the one about time. So yes, uh, well, there would be a lot to say about it, but I'll try. Yeah, it is. You know, like when I first arrived there, like one of the I don't know first week or days, uh, someone someone told me. You, you'll go mad if you stay here for more than a few weeks. You know, we are all mad. And that was like a doctor there. And I kind of laughed at it. I was like, okay, that's a joke, whatever. I mean, yeah, funny. Uh, but after many months and after a year and now after more years, that, that, that sentence feels, uh, you know, it has changed uh, in, in many ways and, and in a, it acquired different meanings. Uh, I've, I've realized what they meant and, and madness, of course, can, can mean a lot of things, but it's basically the fact that the system that has kept this crazy situation going on for now 20 years in Lampedusa in terms of, of proper detention center, uh, landings and all of that put in place with, with a precise order is only possible precisely because of these time spaces, because most of the workers do not stay there for a long time. Mm -hmm. They stay there for uh, months, uh, times, years, it depends. They are usually, if we're talking about doctors, they are usually young uh, undergraduates, people who, who just need to go into specialization, and maybe they didn't get it yet and they want to do some experience. And of course they are committed to, 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 to do this. And then they are exploited to some extent by a system which puts them there without any form of training. Once they are, they get to the burnout situation, the so-called burnout, they either leave or they are told to leave or anyway. And the system keeps going on precisely. It's not that anyone tells you you have to leave, you know, like, but it just goes on like this precisely for these reasons. So everyone who comes is a new one was to relearn the situations. By the time you learn it pretty well, then you are off, you are out. Mm -hmm. And it's also a reason why criticizing it and going against it in a, in, a, in a mass powerful way is difficult because there is this constant crisscrossing of 
people who some know already, some don't know, some have experience, some don't. And, and the same, I think, happens with a lot of journalists and researchers who try to do work in this kind of spaces, going there for a week or two, a day or whatever it is. And, and you know, Lampedusa is a place in which you, you can do a week and, and write for years. The, there is so much stuff that if you want to, 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 to be a shark, I mean, if you want to, to use material, there is material, it's, it's all there, quite ready and available. There is a whole system of people who are there and are used to researchers coming, to journalists coming, to, mm. to, to, to this immense uh, world of people who are interested in understanding what's going on. And so there are volunteers who already have their narratives and they tell you a story. Then there is the workers who tell you another story. Then there is the guy who has the archive who tells you another story. Then there is the activist who tell you another story. And it's all well packed. But if you live there for more time, you start to see beyond that, right? And you start to see the complexities of, of all of these stories. I, I won't go on because otherwise probably mm -hmm. I, I'll take too much time. But I mean, yeah, so I don't know if I answered to uh, uh, yeah. So, yes, absolutely. Yes, thank you. Yeah, and and the thing of confession and redemption, yeah, of course it has a, a religious connotation, and it, it really came from. I was just reading Saint Augustine for some reason, and as I read, I was like, I mean, this speaks too much to I don't know, to to what I'm, uh, to what I'm trying to do here, and of course, uh, it is a provocation mainly. The the fact that it's religious as well is meant to be a provocation itself because usually having religious connotations and using certain words uh, is not something that you do in, in social sciences. So if you do it, you need to find all kinds of reasons to do that. But it, 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 it is really something which links a lot to, to shaking, try to shake also the, 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 the use of words that sometimes are kind of put at the margins, right? And also it is something very, yeah, it is religious, by this also something which has a lot to do with the sort of dialogue with the self, right? And, and so that, that element compared to Anna Arendt's work was perhaps, yeah, I don't know, maybe something else could be used. Also redemption is quite strong, of course. Uh, but yeah, it's more of a, provo of a provocation, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. There must be plenty of questions. Yeah, there is one from Yumna. Hi, do you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Um, Alessandro, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this talk, which I found it for me very helpful. I felt I was not listening for a talk. I was going through a therapy session because I projected on my research. Uh, I'm originally an art historian and I have been into sociology, anthropology and anthropological ethnographical research in the last three years. And I struggled with the questions you have been talking about. Like sometimes I felt I'm so much part of the research and I, I didn't know how to go with it. And I had to talk with anthropologists and they bring up this topic. And apparently, say a la mode, it's fashionable now that the anthropologist talk about himself and how he feels about uh, the research. And uh, taking it one step further about time, yes, you will go crazy. Even myself, I take breaks from, when I can't take it anymore, I step back, I need to take a break for a few months, then go back to research. And uh, for the religious uh, terms, I think sometimes when you are so hopeless and you don't find the right terms or the right language to talk with the immigrants or your subject in the field, you go back to religion, it's psychological. Like whether you like it or not, it's there because sometimes you feel so hopeless, but you wanna say something that might help the people you are working with. So you use religion to provoke, to comfort or to raise other questions. But I still, I'm still struggling with, the, with my space and the place in the research, especially when it comes to tough subjects such as death, etc. But thank you so much. I, I, I learned a lot. It helped me a lot. Thank you very much. <laughs> very much. 
we have a question by Elsa. Elsa, do you want to, 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 to ask your question or do you want me to read it? Hello, uh, can you hear me? Hello. Yeah. Uh, no, it, it was just uh, to to go further as you were talking about this um, constant creep crossing of uh, humanitarians uh, within the islands, and I was just um, having this as a metaphor of the global political level in, in Europe and of all the short time uh, agendas that um, our governments have and. Uh, this uh, reminder me of this and i also wanted to thank you very much for making uh, the effort of trying to analyze your uh, artistic practice um, because uh, i believe it's also an important component of uh, your research uh, and uh, uh, i know it's something you've done quite instinctively and which was not uh, planned and um, I don't know, maybe you, you want to add something about uh, this and what it brought to your uh, research. Yeah, thank you, Elsa. Uh, yeah, 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 it's, uh, uh, it's, it's difficult to, to talk about it. Uh, yeah, it, it was done very instinctively. And, and the, the attempt that, uh, that, that you saw before of trying to make sense of it just came afterwards. It wasn't uh, done with any purpose. It was more of a, of a, of a need that I, I already had for a long time. And, and, and those pieces were just the moment where the need was stronger than anything else. And so I just let it go without even thinking about what it was. But retrospectively, I think that more time, you know, time again here plays, I think, some kind of important role because you, you, you start to detach yourself a little bit from from those moments and to and to and to see the you know to 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 to, to read it differently um i don't know i i, I think uh it would be interesting to engage even more with uh, with this work perhaps trying to to do something now like going back to the island and trying to uh kind of be a little bit more because i was very resistant at that time uh, I would have liked to do many more pieces of work and, and I only done like three or four. But I don't know what, uh, what would happen if I, I would do it now where I feel that it's kind of, it's okay. You, you, you can do it, it's, no one is gonna die uh, if, if you try to, to, to do some art. Uh, so maybe it would be interesting to do a, a second experience of that and, and seeing how <clears throat> these two moments could bring to the surface I don't know, something different perhaps. Uh, yes, I feel like maybe the end was able to express something that was not uh, at the at the brand level at the time, not at uh, the work so level. Certainly. So, uh, this is why maybe you're saying that you needed time to yeah. reflect yeah. on these drawings. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And probably I still do need a lot of time to read properly. I don't know if I'll ever have enough time to probably I just die and I don't know what, what I was trying to say. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Marcus, you want to ask a question? Um, yes, thank you. Um, thanks, Alex and Alessandra. And it's, it, it really resonates also with my um, actually research on like graphic literature and testimonial graphic literature on, on these questions. And um, Although I'm, I, I don't do that, and I see that from a from an outside perspective. So I wonder whether you could still um, dig a bit deeper into um, those two previous um, also remarks about the instinctiveness of it. Like, in terms of, could could you say um, that the artistic creation uh, and not only there, as you have, as one can see, not only their testimonial and political dimension, but their properly like formal and artistic aspect. Um, would they be for you um, like a, a necessary complement or even a transcendent somehow um, uh, to, to, I mean, the supposedly factual and objective methodology and also the ambitions of um, anthropological research um, and like, you know, the focus on the discursive, the technical, the numbers, figures, quantifications, all these things. So. Um, what I'm wondering is, is like, 
in your specific approach seems to lie for me in the fact that you are actually operating on two different regimes of expression and representation. And those two different regimes somehow, I mean, they, they can never entirely fit, mm -hmm. but, they, um, but they resonate with each other. And in your case, I mean, they resonate in your own person and in your own practice. And so I, I wonder, what do you think about these two different regimes of expression and representation? Uh, yeah, th thanks a lot, Marcus. Uh, I, I, don't know, I don't know if I have an answer to that. I, I see what you're saying and I, 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 think, I think the same. Uh, I, what I'm trying to do is to, yeah, okay, they do resonate. And what I'm trying to see is whether it is possible to not necessarily be either one or the other. As you say, in one person, you may try to, to incorporate uh, both. I don't like, also this work has been a lot about <clears throat> challenging categories and categorical thinking. And this can go from the use of certain terms to, 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 to embrace uh, a migrant or a worker or a local to also categories that are used to, to define anthropological knowledge or certain approaches and all of that. So I, I think that we are in a moment in which perhaps there is a little bit more opportunity to try and, and put these differences on the table and make them resonate. I, I don't exactly know what form they could take uh, and how academia or whatever format would be happy to receive one or the other in what forms. But again, it, it all comes from an instinct, again, from a feel, a need. I needed to do things in this way. It's not that I, I've been thinking, oh, look, uh, I like this way and that way, let's put them together. It's more of a need to express uh, the work in these two different forms. And I'm trying to work with them and, and see whether we can find ways of, um, of, of not necessarily uh, having to choose one or the other, you know, but seeing them as complementary, uh, seeing them as things that uh, make the picture more powerful rather than uh, choosing one or the other. But I am very confused about it too. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not, uh... if, I'm, if I may just add something, and I think it's, that, that obviously it makes sense. What, what comes in when we speak about the visual, and it could be any other form of visuals, it could be photography, it could be um, like drawings. I mean, you, you have this use of the painting, is that there might always be this idea of it is illustrating, it's purely illustrating. And when something is purely illustrating, very often it is somehow secondary, um, secondary in time, but also secondary in value. Um, it, so it's secondary time, it comes after and secondary in value because that's not the main thing. And, and in your case, it is not purely illustrating. As yeah. I mean, as far as I, as I see it, uh, like immediately with your, your work. And, and that's something which is interesting because it somehow leads it leads to another dimension. I mean, whatever this means, dimension is another another form of expression, and that's maybe something uh, very in interesting where where you can go beyond this. Um, like you see, it's two different forms. It's it's a harmonious thing, but um, and whether when you can see that this is a it's such a complex um, phenomenon where it cannot be exhausted with only one. Um, regime of whatever representation. Yeah, I yeah, and yeah, th that, that that's that's a very good point, and that that's exactly what I'm trying to to do. Yeah, and and yeah, absolutely, and many other forms. I think like poetry, uh, I, I, you know, like I, last year during COVID, I tried also to write a short uh, graphic novel. Uh, well, tried to turn it into a graphic novel, but then it was just a novel based on 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 this kind of fictional thing. So I, I'm. You know, yeah, you need uh, it's it's uh, yeah, it's something quite complex. So you you need more more ways to to approach it. But yeah, th thanks a lot. Yeah, in a way, I think you what what you what you are confronted with is how uh, the. Um, Difficulty for us uh, academics to to grapple with what cannot be told. Uh, at some point, uh, there is a reality that uh, 
escape from the possibility of being of rationalization. Uh, and so, yeah, so that's when the, uh, the writing becomes uh, trembling. Uh, and once that's when you need something else, uh, another way of expression. Uh, expression. Uh, and it, it struck me when, during your presentation, when you presented the slide with a painting, that's when your, your words and your expression became hesitant. <laughs> As if the, the, yeah, the speech and the, the possibility of voicing something was uh, escaping. Also, yeah, also because uh, it's very strange for me as I see, I'm not an artist, right? I, I just, you know, I, I like painting, but, uh, but, but it, it, it's very strange to, yeah, to, to, to have to use words for that because it speaks in a way by itself, right? So yeah, yeah you're, you're right. But, <laughs> Interesting yeah. to know that uh, it was uh, something you could, <laughs> you could uh, <laughs> see. Yeah. Right. Any other reaction? Yeah. Um, maybe, well, I've got uh, another question. Uh, uh, the, well, you, you talk about confession, but what do you want to confess? What, what is the sin you want to confess? Is it the personal one, your failure of being the Hermes that you wanted to be? Is it a collective one, uh, a collective uh, responsibility of uh, maintaining, reproducing uh, this spectacle of the absurd? And to what extent uh, us as researchers are contributors to this spectacle? And uh, is it, uh, well, there's, yeah, is it, it yeah, is it the incapacity to to um, yeah? Also, we what what I personally found in my own research is that um, I felt guilty in the uh, in well these people this uh, this uh, their life is for us a material, the material what that will feed into our research. So transforming a life into a material. It's kind of yeah, finding your utility in, in, in what uh, in this life, and for me, it has been a source of, 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 of guilt. So there are a lot of things to be confessed, actually. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think all the ones you mentioned, they are all there. We cannot maybe, <laughs> but certainly it, it is a, it is a, a shared failure, as you know. I, I, that's why the use of that word, it's a kind of ringing bell that, that has been ringing for a long time. So you feel also uh, sort of hopeless in, 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 in some ways because you, you, you perfectly know that even, it's not even about explaining how certain systems and processes operate anymore. Because in academic work and, and in migration studies, border studies and all of that, uh, this stuff has been quite well described and detailed and, 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 and told. It's not about unveiling some reality which no one knows about. Uh, things are out there. And so it's even this kind of uh, pressure of, of feeling sort of uh, finding other ways to express something which to some extent has been logically known. Everyone knows, wants to be informed about things uh what is is going on but then sorry no, no yeah sorry it's, it's something yeah. behind me but then the experience of it also seems to carry much more stuff that that, that is not just those logical kind of uh ways of, of of describing how the eu is failing in in letting people die how libya is i mean the, it's it just it's not just that uh, there is more so the, 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 there is that in terms of confession there is of course a personal failure knowing and realizing as we all do in life i guess at some point that you are just uh, uh, a person and that you have limited powers and that maybe maybe you you thought you could do a little bit more and then you realize that that, that you can't but then you but then you have to because you do have the power but it's just not enough to change things and, and struggling with this and realizing also that the others are struggling as well is very important. 
also not to feel alone in this uh, struggle. Of course, we have different kinds of struggle. Uh, but I think it is a window that, that is important to, to, to keep open uh, for us also to have a conversation which is less categorical, like less uh, based on, on fixed terms for which people have certain positions. You are in the right, you are in the wrong. Uh, you belong to this, I belong to that. But trying to open the conversation in the ethical conversation to, to us all. Right, so um, if there is no more reaction or question, um, shall, we, uh, shall we stop here? Bidisha? Bidisha. Yes, sure, sure. Yeah. yeah. Right. Thank so, you so much, Alessandro. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alessandro. Yeah, yeah. It's been a, it's been a wonderful Love being here and listening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so timely and so <laughs> so um, in line with uh, what we want to do here at Thanatic uh, Ethics uh, program. And uh, just to yeah to jump on it and uh, um, announce that we have this upcoming conference on the liminalities of. Uh, life and death, uh, and uh, this is the issue you raised uh, will be uh, at the center of our concern for during this conference. Uh, late April, you can follow the, uh, um, the, the upcoming uh, events in the, on the Thanatic Ethics website. And we have um, another webinar uh, who is scheduled on the 4th of January uh, by Valérie Cusol and Frédéric Leclerc who is, they are going to present their work on the uh, burial uh, among bur burial practices among the uh, North Africans in France. Yeah, Bidisha, do you want to say something else? Um, no, thank you. That's, yeah. that's good. Thanks. All right. So thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.